Good morning, and welcome to our online service. This is a beautiful day, and we give thanks to God for everything that he has done and how he has kept us. And today, as we come to rejoice and we come to give thanks, I would read um, Psalms 100. This is a psalm that says, a psalm for giving thanks, for grateful praise. And we have a lot to be grateful for, a lot to be thankful and to give God praise for. It, sing, it says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Praise his name. For the Lord is good and his loving kindness endureth to all generation. Amen. Thank God for his goodness and for his mercy and for his faithfulness. Let us approach his throne. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come before you, to come into your house, to meet with your people virtually. And as we meet, as we come into your presence, we ask, Lord, that you would be with us, that your spirit would guide us, would take control of everything that would be said and done here today. And may we sing joyfully, and may the worship that we bring before you through songs, through word, through the spoken word, be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to pause and bring you a worship team to come and bring us into the presence of the Lord through singing. Worship team, please come. Sing, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures Sing, blessed be your name. Sing, blessed be your name. Blessed. 
be your name and the lamb that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow blessed place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, oh, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be Thank you so much, worship team. And I trust that as you sang along with them, that the words that we sang bring a memory to you, that it was meaningful to you, that you were not just singing it just for singing, but you were singing praises to the God who has created us, the God who has kept us, and the God who loves us. And uh, right now, before Pastor Steve comes to bring the word to him, to us, may God prepare our hearts. And as I read the scripture, the scripture reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 to the end, verse 22. And Pastor Steve continued the theme of the seven churches. And listen carefully to what God says to this church in Laodicea. It is entitled to the church of Laodicea, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, 
neither hot nor cold. I am about to speak you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth. Do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just, I was, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And at this time, we're going to go before the Lord in prayer, just before Pastor Steve comes. We have much to give thanks to God for and much to bring before him. So let us pray. Our God and Father, you are the faithful and true one. And as we come before you this morning, we thank you that you are God. You ask us to come boldly before you, before your throne of grace, that we may find grace and mercy in time of our need. And Father, we thank you that we can come freely for now to worship you in a land that we have the freedom to do. So many in the world do not have that freedom that we have today. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us not to take this for granted, but that we would be mindful of all that you have done all that you are doing and will continue to do for us. But at the same time, our heart goes out to those of our members who are sick and need a touch from you this morning. We thank you for Igma and his service to you here at North Minister. We pray that you would continue to be with him, undertake for him, and Lord, that your will would be done in his life through these procedures, and at a time when he needs you, that you would be there. You promise never to leave us nor forsake us. And for Pastor Camille, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to guide him and continue to have your way in his life. May your will be done in his life as he waits for the results and as he waits for a change in situation that he's going through right now. Lord, we want so much that you heal him of the difficulties that he's faced with, but we know that everything is done in your time, so we rest everything in your care. And for others in our community that are hurting at this time, many like Joyce Morris, Vera, Prince, and others who have needs who are undergoing difficulty, pain in their bodies, we ask, Lord, that you would visit them in this situation right now. Linda Lee, who still has problems sleeping, we ask that you would visit her. Mary, with her breathing, and others, that you would continue to have your healing hand upon them. But most of all, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are going through tremendous persecution at this time. Many are being killed in India, in Pakistan, in Nigeria. Many are still being abducted and sold. We ask, Lord, that you would undertake. We think of Leah, who has been in captive for two years now. She is 
now given birth to a second child in captivity. We pray that you would help her to continue to look to you. Help her not to give up even in that difficult situation. And others in other places where it's difficult for them to even mention your name, be with them, strengthen them. And Father, we pray for us as we enter again into a situation here at, in the province where decision is made. We ask, Lord, that you would give the government the wisdom that they need as they plan to reopen. May you help us to do the things that is necessary so that we can have in person services where we can meet and come and joyfully proclaim your name in this sanctuary. But Lord, we pray especially for the church universal that you would be with each one of us, that we would continue to be the salt and the light that you want us to be in this darkened world. May your name be uplifted, may your name be praised, and may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We we'll now wait for Pastor Steve to bring us your word. And as we listen, prepare our hearts, O oh Father, for what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Northminster. And uh, welcome back to the seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation. This morning we're going to be uh, looking at the letter to the church at Laodicea. This is the seventh and last of the letters. And uh, interestingly, it's the only letter that has nothing positive in it about the church at Laodicea. And yet it ends with a beautiful invitation, as we'll see, and a, a bridge uh, to the rest of the book of Revelation. Now, we know a fair bit about the church at Laodicea. Uh, it was not one of the churches that was founded by Paul, but it was a part of a network of, we could almost think of it as the tri-city area. There were three churches that were geographically only about five to ten miles apart from each other, very close, and, and networked uh, economically as well. That is the church at Laodicea, the church at Hierapolis, and the church at Colossae. Uh, like I said, it's a, sort of a tri-city area. And Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, talks about the churches in this area quite a bit. In fact, Colossians uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 16, toward the end of his letter, he says to the church at Colossae, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So Paul is encouraging the, uh, the, the believers at uh, Colossae to, to read uh, aloud the letter that came from Laodicea and to make sure that the, the, the letter that he is writing to Colossae will be read in the Laodicean church as well. Um, from the verse before, Paul says, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. So it almost sounds like the Laodicean church was a house church meeting in the home of someone called Nympha. Now, um, when and where was it founded? We're not quite sure when, but we can surmise that it was founded by someone called Epaphras. Again, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, Paul says, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you that, may you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. So it, it looks like Epaphras founded the church uh, at Laodicea, Although um, what we gather is that Paul probably never actually visited it. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. Now, we know from history that Laodicea was a very wealthy city. In fact, about the time that Paul was writing the letter to the Colossians, 60 or 61 AD, there was a great earthquake uh, in the whole region of Phrygia. That was the area of present-day Turkey where these churches were located. So there was a lot of devastation, and many of the cities applied to Rome, to the central government, for a bailout in order to get help with rebuilding. But Laodicea said they don't need Rome's money. They, they're quite capable of rebuilding on their own. 
they were determined to pay for their own repairs and not be in the debt of the central government. Now, where did Laodicea get all this money? What made it so rich? Well, there were three main industries in Laodicea. And as we'll see, uh, uh, John, um, when he is writing the, this word from Jesus, uh, picks up on all three of these industries. The first was banking. Uh, Laodicea was a banking center for the region, so it became wealthy off of banking. Secondly, Laodicea had a, a, a garment industry that was very famous, a particular type of luxury wool uh, that was made from uh, the sheep that were unique to this region. It was a special kind of black wool, soft black wool, very famous, high quality. And, and thirdly, there was a kind of powder that could be mined in the area right around uh, Laodicea, and that powder was used in order to make a special ointment that was good for curing eyes that were afflicted by, uh, by oncoming blindness or by eye trouble, also ears, but especially eyes. So this eye ointment um, was very famous um, as a product of Laodicea, and there was a medical school there specializing in the care of eyes as well. So those three industries really put Laodicea on the map. So Jesus is talking to a wealthy church in a wealthy city. Uh, and it's no surprise that just like the church at Sardis, there's no mention of persecution here. Uh, these, uh, these people in the church of Laodicea knew how to go along in order to get along. Uh, they were quite comfortable in their cultural and economic environment. You don't read about persecution. You don't read about martyrdom. Uh, everyone seems to be quite comfortable, thank you very much. And in this context, Jesus introduces himself. And he says, I am the Amen. I am the faithful and true witness. I am the ruler of creation. Let's look at that, that um, beginning. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Now, what does Amen mean? Jesus introduces himself first here as I am the Amen. It means so be it. Yes, I affirm what you've said. I stand behind what you've said. And Jesus here says he is the Amen. He says, these are the words of the Amen. So this becomes one of his names. Now we know from Paul writing that he says that all of the promises that God made to his people, Jesus is the yes to those promises. Jesus stands behind those promises. He fulfills them. He affirms them. In fact, we can go to these wonderful verses in 2 Corinthians. Let me just read a couple of verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And, and uh, the Apostle Paul says in those verses, beginning at verse 18, But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among, me, uh, among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So Paul is affirming that Jesus is the amen. He is the affirmation of God's promises. He stands behind God's promises. In him the word is yes. And, and uh, we can have total confidence in Jesus, the amen. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't trim his message to suit his audience. He doesn't let us down. He doesn't betray us. He really is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. He's faithful and true. He keeps his word. Jesus is the amen. And then Jesus goes on and he says that he is the faithful and true witness. In fact, this is how he introduced himself back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And, and look at that at the very beginning. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So those two themes that we see in Revelation 3, the letter to Laodicea, are picked up first in Revelation 1, verse 5, that Jesus is the faithful witness and he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is a witness of God's power. He says the firstborn, uh, and, and, and he's the firstborn from the dead. Jesus died from the cross. God raised him from the dead. He's a witness to the power of God and to God's faithfulness in keeping his promises. If God can and did raise Jesus from the dead, he can and will raise us from the dead. He will not abandon us to the tomb, 
just like he did not abandon Jesus to the tomb. He raised Jesus, and he will raise us. That's the promise that we have in Jesus. He's the amen. We can hold on to that promise because he is a faithful witness of what God has done in the past and what God will do for us. And beyond that, uh, Jesus says he is the ruler of God's creation. Now, some of you may have uh, translations like the King James Version, where it actually says he's the beginning of God's creation. Um, but the NIV is much clearer, the ruler of God's creation. Uh, Jesus was, was present at the beginning, but he did not have a beginning, of course, as God. He is without beginning and without end. But he was present at the moment of creation. And he is supreme over creation because he's the creator. He's ruler over the kings of the earth, as we saw in Revelation 1, verse 5. And so we're reminded of that in the letter to Laodicea, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus was God. He was there at the beginning. Now, this is, was a major issue at the, uh, in, in uh, the church in Colossae. And, and uh, so we can imagine that this issue spilled over to the church in Laodicea. Who, who really is Jesus? And, and Paul wrote his letter to the Colossian church primarily to answer that question. They were hearing from a lot of false teachers who were saying that Jesus was the greatest created being. He was the first created being. They were giving him all sorts of, 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 of high titles, but they were not acknowledging that Jesus was God. And Paul says, no, if you don't acknowledge that Jesus is God, you can't be a Christian. You've missed the entire point of the revelation that we have in Jesus Christ. And Paul writes these verses, which I want to read in Colossians chapter 1. They're some of the most magnificent verses we have in the New Testament affirming who Jesus is, beginning at verse 15. And Paul says, talking about Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. These are magnificent verses where Paul captures really the doctrine of Christ in so many ways. If the Colossians and the Laodiceans had really understood and believed that passage that I've just read, the church at Laodicea would have been totally different from what it was. They would have been staggered by the authority of Jesus. He's God and he's creator. They would have noticed that Jesus is all-powerful in the world today, like Paul says, that in him all things hold together. He didn't just make the world and then walk away. Jesus made the world, and he is involved in the life of the world constantly, even in our day. He's the head of the church. Paul said in, in Colossians 1, he's the head of the church. He suffered on the cross, and he was crucified. He was buried in a tomb. But God the Father brought him back to life. He's the firstborn, therefore. He goes ahead of us, and we will follow him. Like Jesus was raised from the dead, so we will be raised from the dead with an eternal body. And he's the linchpin of all creation. And in the last few verses, Paul really lays that out, doesn't he? He's the linchpin of all creation. Jesus is the God-man. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. There we see Jesus as God all the fullness of God dwelling in him. But this God became man through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This God-man, Jesus, took, became incarnate in Jesus Christ. He came to earth and he died on the cross of Calvary. And, and his blood was shed so that we can have reconciliation with God. Like Paul says, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now the Laodicean church had probably already heard that read. They probably had the letter to the Colossian church read in their midst, but they hadn't understood it. Like I said, if they had understood it, they would have been totally different people. 
Really, what Jesus is saying here is, I'm not primarily interested in your head knowledge. If that's where it stops, that knowledge is useless. It is how that knowledge is applied. Has the knowledge gone from your head to your heart? Some people say that's the furthest distance in the world, the distance from your head uh, to your heart. Has that knowledge been applied, and has it changed your life? Has it changed the life of your church? And in the church of Laodicea, it had not. Had they understood that letter to Colossians, they would have been humble, grateful people. Instead, they're arrogant, self-satisfied people. And now Jesus starts to analyze the Laodicean church. He starts off by saying this, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot, or neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, but you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. So I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Strong words that Jesus is saying. Now, some people have thought that, that, that the hot-cold contrast there means I wish you were hot, passionate for my cause, or at least I wish that you were stone cold uh, and, and, and didn't uh, care anything about my cause. Uh, I want you to make up your mind. But that's not what Jesus is getting at here. In fact, he's drawing a, a contrast between who the, uh, the Laodiceans were and a healthy church. And, and Jesus uses two uh, uh, metaphors to describe a healthy church. One is hot water. Now, Hierapolis, I mentioned, was a city that was only about seven miles away to the north. Hierapolis was very famous because it had hot, uh, uh, hot springs. And so it was almost like you could go to Hierapolis and have a hot tub uh, uh, bath. And so there were medicinal um, baths at Hierapolis, very famous for that purpose. People came from miles around in order to get healing in the hot water of Hierapolis. Colossae was just a little bit to the east of, um, uh, of um, Laodicea, and it had a brilliant fresh water supply. The water came from snow melt down from the mountains, and so Colossae had a reputation for its beautiful, fresh, cold water. Laodicea the one problem it had as a city was it had a terrible water supply. Uh, their, their water was, they depended on the river Lycus uh, during the months of the year when it flowed. When it didn't flow, they had to bring their water in by aqueduct, usually from Hierapolis. So this water started off hot. It had to be uh, uh, piped in over an uh, uh, above ground aqueduct for miles. And by the time it got there, it was lukewarm, tasted horrible. And, and, and so no one had anything good to say about the water supply of, of Laodicea. And, and Jesus says, that's what you are like. You're lukewarm. You're not brilliantly cold, like the fresh water, the, the revitalizing, renewing water of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of Colossae. And, and you, you certainly don't have the, the, the restorative hot water that, that Hierapolis has. In fact, you're just lukewarm. Who wants to drink water like that? Instead, you've become self-aggrandizing. You're self-satisfied. You're self-promoted. You're self-promoting. You're, you're smug. Jesus says, I can't work with a church like that. Uh, you think you're totally self-sufficient. You think you don't really need me. So you're just going through the religious motions. You, you say you don't need, need me. In fact, you say you don't really need anyone. Look at this in verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. And, and so that was the attitude. You're quite content in, in your own little world, Jesus says. Uh, you have all the wealth you, you think you need. You're, you're as comfortable as you think you need to be. You have no desire for a personal experience of God. You have no desire to get to know him better. You have no desire to, for holiness in your life. But you don't know how to look at yourself honestly. You see what you want to see. You don't see what God sees. And now Jesus starts to pull back uh, the, the curtain, and he's exposing Laodicea as God sees Laodicea. He says, you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now, wretched and pitiful, what a way to begin. This is a church that was so socially prominent, that was so wealthy, uh, that was so um, affluent and, 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 and comfortable. And Jesus says, you're wretched and pitiful. You're no better than beggars on the street. You see yourself a, 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 as... Uh, privileged people, but God sees you as beggars in desperate need, wretched and pitiful. You're poor, 
One of your main industries is banking, and you think you have all the money in the world uh, that you need, but gold won't save you. Every one of you is going to die one day, and all of you are going to have needs that gold will not satisfy. Gold will not help you when you face God in eternity. Gold will not satisfy we, when we're looking at the deepest cravings of your heart, the craving for meaning, the craving for significance, the craving for a, craving for a sense of eternal security, uh, the craving for forgiveness, the cra craving for being cleaned from the inside. Gold can't buy you any of those things, God says. And, and what's more, you're blind. Remember, Laodicea was the city that was so famous for its eye ointment. Uh, people would come from miles around in order to get their eyes cured. And yet God says, really, you're blind. In the things that matter, you don't see at all. You don't even know what you don't know. You're putting all your confidence in yourselves, in your religious games. You don't see yourself as God sees you. You don't see that God has written you off to the extent that he is going to spit you out of his mouth, lukewarm. You're just performing religious theater, Jesus says. It has no power to change your life. It has no power to, to guarantee you uh, um, eternity. And it has no power to change the world around you. And you're naked. You know, Laodicea, I mentioned, was a city where some of the finest wool cloth in, in the Roman Empire was, was, was uh, uh, spun and woven. Um, it was beautiful black cloth. And God says, you may be walking around with fine clothes today, but no one, can, no one sees like God what's underneath the clothes. God sees right through to the heart. You can't protect yourself from God's vision, even with the finest clothes in the world. You're an open book. All your hypocrisy, God sees through it. All your cheesy compromises that you make in your business life or in your personal life, God sees through them. Your lies, your, your, your petty thefts, your cruelties, your backstabbing. God knows who you really are. You know, you may, th you, you may as a businessman, you may think you're successful because you, you cheat someone out of $1,000 and then you make a big show about coming into church and giving an offering of $100. God sees through it, all of those games and hypocrisies. God says, before me, you are as one naked. Now the temptation uh, on the part of the people at Laodicea and the temptation that ran right through the Old Testament um, is for God's people to say, I don't really need anything. In the Old Testament, we saw that cycle over and over again, didn't we? That God would bless the people of Israel. Uh, within a generation or so, they'd become so successful that they were no longer grateful. They took it for granted. And then another generation, they would actually ignore God. They didn't need God anymore. They, 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 they uh, had the world in the palm of their hands as far as they were concerned. God would have to come in and punish them and remind them of their dependence on him, their radical dependence on God for life and for, for provision. The solution, in other words, to the Laodicean problem is a recognition of how truly and, and uh, radically dependent we are on God. He owes us nothing. We owe him everything. You know, you can think some people have a brush with death, for instance, don't they? And th then they, or they ne nearly die of an illness, and their response is bitterness. Other people, they have a brush with death or, 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 or um, uh, nearly die of an illness, and it opens their heart to God. It makes them realize for the first time how indebted they are to God, how dependent they are on God. And it begins a new chapter of their spiritual life. And God says, here's my counsel to you. Recognize how radically dependent Radically, I mean right to the root of your being and your existence. Recognize how radically dependent you are on God and on his goodness to you. Don't be satisfied with what you have because that's just making you smug and selfish. You're lukewarm. And Jesus says, I want real commitment. Now, what does being lukewarm look like to you? I mean, it can look like different things to different people. But... Uh, for some, it influences their giving. Do you know, um, some people, their, their attitude toward giving is, hmm, uh, I have an extra $10 hanging around at the end of this month, so I'll be a, I'll, I'll be a big guy and, and, and put $10 in the offering place, and God will be really grateful. Of course, that's not sacrificial giving. That's actually almost an insult to God, isn't it? I'll give you a bit of leftovers because I don't really need it this month. It's been a good month. That is a lukewarm 
Laodicean response to God's call on us to sacrificially give. Or you can say, I don't really have any hunger to read God's word. I don't need to know more about his truth. I have no desire even to read a Christian book. How many months have you gone without reading scripture or without reading a good Christian book and packing into your heart knowledge of God and his word? A Laodicean would not be reading the Bible or, the, or a Christian book, would not be um, building up their understanding of God in, the, in that way. Or a Laodicean will come to church when they feel like it because it meets a social need. Uh, I'm not feeling so great today. Uh, I, I, I didn't have a great week. I'll just stay home. Thank you very much. Um, because it doesn't happen to suit my, my social needs uh, this week. That's a Laodicean approach. God says that kind of Christianity I will spit out of my mouth. I don't need it. It's an insult to me and, and, and it is no help to you or to the world around you. Or in your personal life, you know, how, when was the last time that you testified in any way before anyone to the fact that, that Jesus is the savior of your life and of your soul? Um, the, do people around you even know that you're a believer? Uh, I'm sure that the people around the Laodiceans didn't know that they had a Christian witness. Um, they, they just you know, uh, went along to, uh, uh, with, with the crowd. They went along with the flow. It was very comfortable for them. Jesus says, I'll spit that kind of, of uh, confession out of my mouth. It's useless to me. But Jesus says, you know what? You need real riches. Uh, and, 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 and look at this. He says to me, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, salve to put on your eyes so you can see. There are three themes again, aren't they? Uh, gold, the wealth, the, the city of banking. And then I counsel you to, to uh, wear white clothes. This is the city that was famous for its black wool. Jesus says, I counsel you to wear white clothes so you can cover your nakedness. Salve to put on your eyes. This was the city with the miracle cure of eye ointment. And, and Jesus says, that's what I, I recommend for you. Uh, the, the, uh, it's striking, isn't it? First of all, because uh, uh, he says, you need to buy true riches, gold refined by fire our precious salvation. And, and then secondly, he says, you, 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 you need to have clothes, white clothes, that, that, that are going to be the symbol of our righteousness before God. And you know, there's a marvelous hymn that um, we really don't sing anymore, and that's a shame, because this truth of the being clothed with the righteousness of, of, of Christ comes through so strongly in this hymn. You know, it's called um, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness. Let me just read the first verse. Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds in these arrayed with joy shall I lift up my head. Marvelous words. Those words actually were written by Count von Zinzendorf, um, who is a name not nearly well enough known uh, to us Christians in the 21st century. He was uh, an Austrian count, uh, lived from 1700 to 1760. And uh, although he was born to great wealth and privilege in Austria as a count, uh, he committed his life to founding the Moravian Brethren. It was a community of, of believers uh, in, in um, uh, Moravia, which is today part of uh, the Czech Republic. And, and uh, he, that community was committed to to being missionaries, real New Testament missionaries. And actually, this is the beginning of the modern missionary movement was the Moravian Brethren, a community of less than a thousand people. And they gathered together uh, over the space of a couple or time period of a couple of decades. And that small community sent missionaries to Egypt. They sent missionaries to the Inuit in Labrador. They sent missionaries to Turkey, to Sri Lanka, to Greenland, to South Africa to West Africa, to Algeria, to the West Indies. In fact, some of the Moravian brothers sold themselves into slavery so they themselves could become slaves and therefore become missionaries to the slaves in the West Indies, especially in Suriname. And, and uh, there were other Moravian brethren that went to Romania as missionaries or uh, into the Jewish uh, community in Amsterdam, literally all over the world. 
These were not Laodiceans. These were people who were clothed with the righteousness of Christ. These were people who understood how precious their salvation was. And, and uh, it'll be marvelous to meet them uh, and, and to hear uh, more about them in, in glory. But these were people who understood that Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. I'm clothed in the wonderful righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's put it on for me, and, and he has marked me as righteous in God's sight. Midst flaming worlds, in these arrayed with joy shall I lift up my head. So Jesus is saying, right now you think you can see. Actually, you've become blinded by all your wealth and security. You need to buy heavenly ointment, he goes on, so you can really see. So you can be filled with spiritual insight, the kind of insight that only comes from the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, white clothes to wear, and salve to put on your eyes. Buy with what? Buy with what? What Jesus is offering here is literally priceless. How can we buy our salvation? How can we buy our righteousness? How can we buy the wisdom and spiritual insight that comes from the Holy Spirit? And of course the answer is, we cannot. We do not have the currency that can buy our salvation. We do not have the currency that can buy our righteousness. That comes from God. That is a gift of God. And you know, there's a wonderful passage in Isaiah, many of you know this, but Isaiah chapter 55, where the prophet Isaiah is so filled with the awareness that, that, that it is all of that we have spiritually, our, our, our salvation, our relationship with God, comes to us as a gift from God. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 and 2. Let me read that for you. Okay. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. God says, come to me, buy. I am the one that will provide you the currency with which you can gain these gifts, gift of salvation, the gift of righteousness. So God is going to provide us the currency that we need in order to receive these gifts. Gifts that the Laodiceans knew nothing about. A gift like a life filled with inner peace, the peace that comes from God. A life that comes filled with, this, with forgiveness, the sense that we've been cleansed, cleaned from all the dirtiness in our lives, from all of the sin in our lives. God has cleaned us. A life that's marked by spiritual power. We can become more like Jesus. Our lives become more and more marked by the character of Jesus, the kind of power that comes from the Holy Spirit and enables us to become increasingly the people we want to be the people that we know we should be, living lives filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Do you know, when we look at the beauty of the world around us, we will be able to have spiritual eyes that see beyond the beauty to the creator of that beauty. And, and uh, we will have hope for eternity. God provides us with the, the currency we need to gain things like the hope for the eternity. So that as we look around us and the, the issues in the world around us right now, the ugliness in the world around us, we know within the interior of our being that this is not the end, that God has something so wonderful uh, in store for us in eternity. We can look toward the future, the eternal future, with confidence and not with despair. And you know, if necessary, we have something to die for. Uh, like the martyrs in, in, uh, in some of the other cities that we looked at. Uh, they actually died for their faith. They had something to die for. You know, someone said, if you have nothing worth dying for, you have nothing worth living for. And I think there's so much truth in that. If you have nothing worth dying for, you have nothing worth living for. These men and women in Laodicea had nothing really worth dying for. And so therefore... They had nothing really worth living for. Contrast them with the other churches, the faithful churches that we heard about, like Smyrna and, 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 and so on, where 
these men and women had something worth dying for. And, and uh, yet Jesus says at the end of the letter, I haven't given up on you. Laodiceans, I have not given up on you. And so although he has nothing positive to say about the Laodiceans, it's not as though this, is, this letter has nothing positive to say to us. Jesus has not given up on the Laodiceans. He has not given up on us. The door, mind you, is not open. Look at this. Uh, Jesus says in verse 19, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The door is not open. It's up to the Laodiceans. It's up to us to open that door. The door is there, and Jesus is knocking on it. And this verse is quoted so often, isn't it? It's quoted very often as an evangelistic verse. Um, and, you know, if it brings people to salvation, that's wonderful. But this verse is actually written within the context of a church that was faithless, of a church that had completely turned its back on its, on its, um, uh, on its calling, and it was living uh, church really as theater. And, and, and Jesus is saying, do you know what? Uh, you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I want a relationship with you, but it's up to you. I'm knocking and I'm asking for a relationship of intimacy. I'm asking you to abandon your lukewarmness and to have a relationship with me that's hot and cold. Hot because it's full of, it's full of, uh, uh, of energy and power. Cold because it's fresh and it's renewing. Uh, I want a relationship with you that's hot and cold, not a relationship that is uh, just lukewarm. What amazing condescension that Jesus shows here when he's writing to the church at Laodicea. You know, he, he's writing, and Jesus, who's the ruler of kings, he's been introduced himself in this letter as the creator of the world. He comes to us who are spiritually poor. He comes to us who are naked and hungry, spiritually blind. And he says, I want to have a relationship with you. I'm knocking on the door. I'm waiting for you to open the door so that we can have a relationship, so that we can share a meal. Do you know, some of you have seen this painting, reproductions of this painting. It's a famous painting done in the 1850s. It hangs in uh, Keeble College in, at Oxford University in England. Um, but it depicts Jesus, and he's standing in front of a door. It's nighttime. And he's standing in front of a door holding a lantern. Uh, the critical thing about that picture, uh, and, and this was intended by the artist, is that there is no doorknob on that picture. In, in, in fact, people pointed that out to the artist, and he said, no, that was deliberate. There's no doorknob, because Jesus is not the one who's going to open the door. Jesus is knocking on the door, but the doorknob is on the inside. It's for those who are hearing that knock to respond. And, and uh, that, that painting is saying, are you like the church at Laodicea? Jesus is knocking, and he's asking you to acknowledge your dependence on him. He's asking you to acknowledge your need, your blindness, your nakedness, your, 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 um, uh, and, and are you in your proud self-sufficiency saying, I don't need you. I can just play religious theater, and, and I'll be just fine. Um, Jesus says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That kind of lukewarm Christianity, I will have nothing to do with. But if you open the door, Jesus says, I will have a relationship with you, an intimate relationship with you. Um, I will eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, Jesus goes on, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. An incredible promise. Jesus is offering to share his throne. Now, of course, Jesus sits on that throne by right because he's the son of God. But we sit on that th throne by invitation. Jesus is saying, I am willing to have you sit on my throne, share my authority for eternity. That's what is on offer to the church at Laodicea. And, and, and Jesus says, if you have received this birthright, if you've received this gift, that you will sit as overcomers. Uh, verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You know, this is um, setting the stage for the rest of the book of Revelation, which is uh, a description of the, uh, the church uh, during the, um, the, the, the church age. 
and, and, and leading up to, the, uh, to Jesus coming again. Uh, in some parts of it, very difficult to read. Uh, but the message is that there will be those who overcome. The Laodiceans, uh, as, as they're depicted here, will not be overcomers. They will not share in, in the glory that is going to come at the end of the age. Um, but the invitation is there. And the invitation is there to everybody who reads this letter. Are you a lukewarm Laodicean or are you a hot and cold uh, believer who's committed to Jesus Christ and, and, and truly committed to living out a life that, that uh, glorifies him? And I, I just want to close with these verses because in um, that theme of overcoming is picked up again in Revelation chapter 21, right toward the end of the book. And Jesus, uh, uh, we see these verses. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. There it is again, without cost. God has the currency that we need in order to buy uh, living water. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. What a marvelous promise that Jesus gives in Revelation chapter 21 to those who overcome, to those who are committed to living a life which glorifies him. We will overcome, and we will share in uh, by sitting on the throne with him for eternity. Amen.
crucified to sin.